You know, today, church, as I said, we are going to be continuing on in our last two messages on the book of Proverbs, and today we're going to be focusing specifically on Proverbs chapter 30, verses 1 to 6. And um, I picked this text today because um, I'd like us to see how I think God's Word actually addresses something that's really common in our culture, and that is the modern Western belief that all truth is relative and there's no such thing as absolutes. The reason I want to talk about this is because um, I've spent a lot of time on college campuses and also engaging with people in our city, and one of the things I hear very often from people is they'll say stuff like, well, that may be true for you, but it's actually not true for me. Now, I know this sounds very humble and gracious, like I'm not imposing on anything. It's typically Canadian, I think, as well. Um, but the, it, the truth of the matter is, if you dig deeper and probe into people's lives, I don't think anybody really lives like this. Most people, if you talk to them and you grapple with this thing and you ask them the question of us, do you think that you're a good person? Most people in response will tell you, yeah, I, I, I think I'm a good person. But the real question you have to ask as you probe is, on what basis do you actually think that you're a good person? Like, how do you define good? Like, do you get to define good for yourself? Is it something that your culture actually defines for you and that you live good relative to your culture? Or are there absolute things which actually make you good, or which everybody's supposed to live by? You know, the question I often ask people, I would say, is if you have no absolute standard for how to define good, how do you know that your life is actually good? How do you know that you're good today, that you think you are, won't be judged by another culture or the future as actually being bad? Does that matter? See, the deal is, when you're sailing on this like sea of moral relativity that's so common here, you really will find yourself adrift, and though you might be today's hero, you might actually become tomorrow's villain. You know, in 2016, the research institute in Canada called the Angus Reid Institute did a survey actually on Canadian morality, what Canadians believe about their own morality. The interesting thing is they found that only 16% of Canadians, 16%, that's like one in six people, believe in moral absolutes. The rest have some sort of mixture of most things are, uh, are either morally gray or perhaps that most things are moral, but not. I wouldn't say moral absolutes exist. Now, it's really interesting because despite the fact that it's only 16%, there were still a number of things that Canadians wholeheartedly agreed were bad. For example, 89% of Canadians would agree that having affairs or cheating on your spouse is morally wrong. Cheating on your taxes, 79%. Telling jokes about another race, less, 67%. You can go farther down the list. For example, buying sex, the numbers drop more, 65%. Pornography, only 40% would consider it morally wrong. Now, here's the deal. When you look at all these things, who's correct when you're talking morally speaking? You know, perhaps what's most interesting, the latest trend is how things that were not moral issues before are now becoming moral issues in our culture today. So, for example, one of the things that Canadians vote, 41% would say wearing a fur coat is morally wrong. Another 38% would say that buying a gas-guzzling SUV is morally wrong. Furthermore, while 32% of Canadians would condemn euthanasia, 62% would condemn scientific testing on animals. See, there has been a shift that's been taking place in our culture, and this shift has actually not gone unnoticed because it's been happening actually for a while now. Actually, just 11 years ago, Maclean's magazine in 2009 published, wrote this. They noted that there has never been a better time to be a Canadian mink or a seal or a lab rat. Canadians today are more likely to moralize about the treatment of animals than about the lives of our fellow humans. It's Canadian. Dr. Kerry Bowman is a bioethicist at the University of Toronto at the Joint Centre for Bioethics there. He makes a very similar observation. He says, morality is actually very complicated stuff in terms of where it comes from and what we hang on to and how we change. Attitudes towards non-human life, and I include both the environment and animals in that, is in a rapid transition. When animals are abused, the public reaction is phenomenally strong. Whereas people aren't lining up to help street people. It's very complex and strange stuff. You, you, you see, 
how much morality in our own country has changed in just a few decades. What we value, what we think is important, and what we would condemn is completely different from 20 years ago. You know, we would judge the previous generations of Canadians as being racist, homophobic, sexist, amongst a whole bunch of other things. But if this data can be trusted, what will happen is probably in the next 20 or 30 years, the next generation of Canadians are going to point a finger at us and judge us as being immoral, saying that we were a generation who were responsible for environmental use. We were a generation of people who used animals cruelly in lab experiments. And furthermore, we were a generation of people who were so barbaric and so animal-like that we dared to butcher animals for their flesh and cook them and eat them. You know, perhaps it might just be that one day, Canadians of the future will actually dig up photos of you on social media, Twitter, or whatever you've posted, you being at a barbecue or you going hunting, and then they'll post it somewhere and then publicly shame you. And your employer will get a hold of that and then fire you from your job and say, in the release statement, the views of this employee does not reflect the values of our company that values all life. And that will be the end of you in our cancel culture. It's entirely possible in 20, 30 years if we follow where the trend is going. See, 150 years ago, Sir John A. Macdonald, the first Prime Minister of Canada, was lauded as a hero for opening up the West with the Canadian Pacific Railway and a whole bunch of other things. Today, in our culture, his statues are being torn down or defaced around Canada because of his poor treatment of the Chinese, First Nations, and other groups. See, it's fascinating, right, because just a century in our own country can turn a person from a saint and a builder of a country to a devil, basically. And the question is, what will you do if the only thing you have to evaluate your sense of goodness is your own personal subjectivity or even your cultures? I mean, time and history have shown alone that those, are not, are not found, those aren't solid and they can change in a short period of time. What are you basing your own sense of goodness on? Are you actually a good person and by whose standard? See, without absolute truth, you can't actually answer that question. So the question for us then is, if that question is really important, how then can we live? And what I wanted to do today is I want us to look at Proverbs 30, verses 1 to 6, because I think there is an answer to be found here from God's Word, a precious answer. And as we look at this passage, I would like us to be aware of three things as we study this text. One is that the journey to true wisdom begins by acknowledging we are not wise. The second thing is that only God has access to true wisdom, true wisdom about what is right and wrong, how to live. And the third thing is that God's true wisdom is revealed through His Word. Okay? So the first one, let, let's look at these. The journey to true wisdom begins by acknowledging that we are not wise. Let's read verses 1 to 3 together from our text. The words of Agur, son of Jake, uh, the oracle. The man declares, I am weary, O God. I am weary, O God, and worn out. Surely I am too stupid to be a man. I have not the understanding of a man. I have not learned wisdom, nor have I knowledge of the Holy One. You know, the opening words of this chapter in Proverbs 30 are absolutely fascinating. You know, normally when you look at wisdom literature... All these books actually start with something else. They start with a declaration of the wisdom of the author who is writing. Now, for example, if you look at an ancient Egyptian work called the uh, Instruction of Amenemope, which is kind of has a book which has a lot of parallels to the book of Proverbs, this is how the book starts instead. It says, The beginning of the instruction about life, the guide for well-being, written by the superintendent of the land, experienced in his office, the offspring of a scribe of the beloved land, the superintendent of produce who fixes the grain measure, who protects the king by his tax rolls, the scribe who places the divine offering for all the gods, the owner of a pyramid tomb on the west of Senate, Amenemope, the son of Kanakt. You see how this works, right? It's, you know why you should listen to me? Because I'm Mr. Amenemope. I am a government official, basically a member of the House of Parliament. I'm also the Minister of Finance who rules over the wealth of the country. I, uh, the king listens to me. I actually make the offerings to the gods, and I'm so rich that I actually own a pyramid tomb. In other words, basically, because I'm a success, you listen to what I have to say. And, and that's generally how people ground their authority and ground what they have to say. You listen to me because obviously I'm wise and other people think so as well. We do the same thing in our culture today. 
You look, for example, at the, at the well-known speaker and leader, um, uh, the a Admiral William McRaven, who served 37 years basically with the Navy SEALs and ended basically his time in the U.S. military as the commander of all the United States Armed Forces. Fascinating individual. He uh, uh, has spoken at convocations and a number of things, passing on wisdom from his time in the Special Forces, wisdom for life. Now, one of the most interesting things is I was looking through his list of books that he'd written and some of his speeches, and I was thinking about my own kids and millennials. For those of you who are kids and millennials who are actually still living at home, I thought about why is it that when your mom looks at you and tells you to make your bed, that you grumble and that you complain about it, or you roll your eyes? But the same token, when William McRaven, the admiral, writes a book called Make Your Bed, Little Things That Can Change Your Life, and maybe the world. People rush out in droves and buy up a million copies of this book, making it a New York Times bestseller. What, I mean, what difference does it make? The admiral telling you to make your bed or your mom? And I think I know why you roll your eyes at your mother and you don't take it seriously, because you think, that's just my mother. She's not particularly important. What does she know about life? But Admiral McRaven? People look up to him, leader of the United States Command Force. If he's telling me to make my bed, better listen to him. Same thing, source and authority matters. See, this is normally how we think about wisdom. We think if I can respect the person or the person telling me something has a reason, you know, to speak like that, then maybe I should listen to them if they're successful. See, this is fascinating because when you look at the biblical text here, how does Agur begin his teaching on wisdom? This is the first time he appears here in the Proverbs. He doesn't appear the same way that everyone else does. He begins with the exact opposite type of confession. He starts off with, God, I'm too stupid. God, I don't have understanding. God, I don't have the knowledge of the Holy One. That's a great way to, bring your, you know, to begin a wisdom book. But yes, in actually the thinking of God, I think this is the best way actually to begin your book. You know, up until the Enlightenment, which was an intellectual, political, and philosophical movement that literally transformed our world as we know it about three centuries ago or so. Basically, people at that time tied knowledge and discovery basically to belief in God. And what happened after the Enlightenment was that reason kind of became the king of all things, and people said, no, if I want to figure out stuff in the world, all I need is reason, and reason can help me figure out all truth. Who needs God anymore? Get rid of him. Now, what's interesting is that the Enlightenment and, you know, rational thinking and reason did a lot of good for our world. So if you look, for example, at the scientific method, we have that that was born out of that to thank for medical advances, the fact that we have airplanes today, great transportation, and so on. A lot of good things came about of using reasoning and thinking through things and the scientific method. But the one thing I can say also about the Enlightenment is that the Enlightenment, despite its advances in some aspects of our civilization, the Enlightenment certainly did not help us when I think it came to morality. See, scientific advances have given us incredible things like weapons, like the atomic bomb. But what science and advances have not done is helped us to figure out whether or not we should push the button that launches that bomb in the first place. See, how do we determine what is right and wrong? How do we know that something that could seem to be destructive and hurtful to multiple people is actually the right thing to do or is actually objectively evil and wrong? On what basis actually can we make absolute statements about morality? Where can we get the genuine wisdom to know how to speak about things, about life? And this is what brings us to point two here. When you're talking about wisdom, when you're talking about absolutes, we need to consider who God is. Number two, only God has complete and true wisdom. Look at verse four with me. Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has wrapped up the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name? Surely you know. You know, this is, this is how Agur works here, right? He begins his discussion with four rhetorical questions, right? He starts by first establishing the vertical plane that, is, that exists between God and man, right? He says, you know, up, down, ascended to heaven, and come down. And then afterwards, he establishes the horizontal by plane by saying ends of the earth, right? West and east, as far as you can go. 
And basically what he says here is, are you like this God who knows every square inch of the universe, up, down, left, and right? There's not an area that isn't covered by him. And furthermore, you want to know something else about this God? Guess who he is? He is the one who deals with the elements of our world that make our world go round, the wind and the rain. Now, in the text here, he specifically says, who has wrapped up the waters in a garment? And I think what he's talking about here is basically the clouds and the rain that comes out of those clouds and the winds that push them around the globe. And we need rains because that's what waters our fields and gives us basically the food that we need to eat. So he's saying not only does who is this one who is everywhere, but who is the one actually that sustains the earth with its wind and its water? Who is this one? Surely you know. And his point is this. You want wisdom? You need to start talking about this one. All discussion about wisdom starts right here. Before we go anywhere else, start right here with the Creator God who has done all these things and is this powerful. Now, the second question that he asks at the end of this little four rhetorical questions that he gives is, what is his son's name? Now, I know for us as Christians, the immediate thing that we do, and we jump to is say, oh, that must be Jesus Christ, because that is true. Jesus really is God's true son, the true Israel, the true servant of God. Nothing wrong with that, fully right. But the question is, is that what it's talking about here? In fact, the New King James Version actually translates this and puts a capital S there for a son, making it very obvious in their translation that this is Jesus Christ. Now, although, like I said, we all know Jesus is God's son, I don't think this is who Agur is referring to in context here. Actually, if you read the book of Proverbs, the word son, whenever it's used over and over again in the immediate context, always refers actually to the student in this particular case. See, the whole book, if you look at it, reads like advice from a father to a son. But it's not just one father talking to his son. It's very clear that this is a book for all of Israel, for wisdom instruction to be given to all of God's people. That is God's children, right? And God's children, the people of Israel, are called throughout the Bible God's son. So if you look, for example, in Exodus 4.22, when God demands that his children be released to go to worship Pharaoh, he says, Israel is my firstborn son. So the idea here is that the son is the receiver of the instruction of the divine word of God. So in other words, when Agur is talking here, in a nutshell, he's saying, on my own, I absolutely despair because I don't have wisdom in it of myself. I am too stupid. But do you know what? The almighty God who made everything and knows every square inch of this universe, this one is my teacher. He is my instructor. And guess what? I, because I belong to Israel, his covenant people, am a privileged son. So no need to despair. Who's his son here? Those who belong to him, his covenant people, those whom he addresses and are in a privileged relationship to receive true wisdom and revelation from God. See, it's so important to understand this because human wisdom, unlike divine wisdom that we see in this text, is not infallible. All you need to do is think about your own life. How many things did you think were right in your own life and then later somebody showed you were wrong? You were wrong, right? Those of you who are married, right? You made great decisions in your own mind. Your spouse told you, eh, I don't think that's a good idea, but you wouldn't listen, right? You went right ahead with it. At the end of the day, like, told you so. And it's so painful, right? In your own experience, it doesn't take you long to be married or even to go through life and realize there are often things that you have to confess for afterwards and say, yeah, in hindsight, 2020, that was a terrible idea. The same thing goes for just about anything in life, even scientific knowledge. You know, in the 1930s, before people discovered the link between lung cancer and smoking, a number of doctors and physicians and people recommended smoking to actually calm nerves and to help people actually with problems that they had. You know, in the past, people said forest fires were bad, and now even though we were choking under the inability to open our windows here in Vancouver because of the forest fires in Washington, a number of ecologists say, no, 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 no. Forest fires are actually part of a natural part of the ecosystem. You have to let some of them burn as well. You know, it's very different how things have changed. You know, today, philosophers argue that morals are actually relative. There's no such thing as values. they are only evaluations. Or no culture is better than another culture. The only thing that's forbidden is actually to forbid someone from doing something. Now, it's so interesting, right? Because when you live in this culture of moral relativism, many people don't see the self-contradictory nature of moral relativism. 
I mean, the very fact that you can say something like, it is forbidden to forbid, is in itself a contradictory statement. I mean, what gives you the right then to say that you see all things correctly and that the only thing that you believe is absolute in this world is to forbid? So you're saying nothing is forbidden except to forbid? Or when people say stuff like, all religions are the same in this world. They all have some part of the truth. No religion has the right to push truth on another because they all only see a part of the truth. I have to say that, excuse me, how do you know that is to be true? If you're saying that religions are all like blind men feeling the elephant, you know, and they all grasp a different part of the elephant and nobody has a part of the truth, are you assuming that you're the only one out of all the religions in the world that stands far enough back to see that everybody else is blind and that really is an elephant there? What gives you that authority to be able to make such a claim? So although we think that such a claim to say, oh, well, everyone has a part of the truth sounds so humble, so Canadian, so gracious, it really is not. It actually is very arrogant. And it puts you in a position to say, I am the one who sees all things clearly. It is an absolute truth claim. And if you are claiming that all truth is relative, you are contradicting yourself by making such an absolute truth claim. You know, I love what journalist Steve Turner wrote in his poem, Creed, that basically shows and highlights the self-defeating logic of a moral relativistic world. Love his poem. He says, We believe in Marx, Freud, and Darwin. We believe everything is okay, as long as you don't hurt anyone, to the best definition of your definition of hurt and to the best of your knowledge. We believe in sex before, during, and after marriage. We believe in the therapy of sin. We believe that adultery is fun. We believe that sodomy is okay. We believe that taboos are taboo. We believe that everything is getting better despite evidence to the contrary. The evidence must be investigated and you can prove anything with evidence. We believe there's something in horoscopes, UFOs, and bent spoons. Jesus was a good man, just like the Buddha, Muhammad, and ourselves. He was a good moral teacher, although we think his good morals were bad. We believe that all religions are basically the same, at least the one that we read was. They all believe in love and goodness. They only differ on matters of creation, sin, heaven, hell, God, and salvation. We believe that after death comes the nothing, because when you ask the dead, what happens is they say nothing. If death is not the end, if the dead have lied, then it's compulsory heaven for all, excepting perhaps Hitler, Stalin, and Genghis Khan. We believe in Masters and Johnson. What's selected is average, what's average is normal, and what's normal is good. We believe in total disarmament. We believe that there are direct links between warfare and bloodshed. Americans should beat their guns into tractors and the Russians would be sure to follow. We believe that man is essentially good. It's only his behavior that lets him down. This is the fault of society. Society is the fault of conditions. Conditions are the fault of society. We believe that each man must find the truth that is right for him, and reality will adapt accordingly. The universe will readjust. History will alter. We believe that there is no absolute truth, excepting the truth that there is no absolute truth. We believe in the rejection of creeds and the flowering of individual thought. If chance be the father of all flesh, disaster is his rainbow in the sky. And when you hear state of emergency, sniper kills 10, troops on rampage, whites go looting, bomb blast school, it is but the sound of a man worshiping his maker. It's profound what he has to say about it. You, know, you realize how contradictory a worldview of moral relativism is, you realize nobody actually truly lives by it. And the best way that you can see that nobody actually lives by this self-contradictory worldview is when you actually go through suffering and you yourself experience injustice in your life. You know, I once heard the story actually of a professor who was a staunch advocate basically of moral relativism, and he taught this to his class. One day, however, he went to his class, and he went on a rage actually about the fact that his daughter actually had been raped and brutally treated. And he talked to his class about how this was evil and this was wrong. And in his class, there was a brave Christian college girl who put up her hand. And first, she expressed her sympathy to him for what had happened to his daughter. And then she courageously asked him a question, basically saying to him, Sir, if what you're saying 
about what happened to your daughter is evil and wrong and not right by any standard, what are we supposed to make of all the things that you taught us actually in the last class? The professor looked at her and stared at her for a long time while everyone watched. And then he turned to his class and said, class, destroy the notes from last class because I no longer believe what I taught. You know, I remember another story told by an apologist, John Jeroge, about a mother who gave birth to a baby in a foreign country somewhere in a hospital. And during the C-section, what happened was the doctor made a mistake and basically damaged uh, the baby, hurt the baby so that the baby could not actually breathe and breastfeed at the same time. Now, the doctor basically told her, it's okay, the baby will recover in a couple of days, just go home, and that'll be it. When the baby didn't actually get better, the mother came back to the hospital to seek some medical advice. And to her horror, she discovered that the hospital had actually destroyed all the records of her visit to the hospital. And then they told her that if she dared to come back to the hospital again, they would call the police and report her for what she had done in harming her own infant. You know, you, you read a story like that and you think, my goodness, how could anyone do such a thing? That's so evil for you to take what you had done in your negligence and to pin it on someone else and to dare to turn them over to the police. Like, how low do you have to go? I think any sensible person listening to a story like that would say, that's wrong. I don't care which culture you come from. That is absolutely unjust. Evil, in fact. See, it's times like this, we as Christians go to the Bible, we feel the outrage, and we read things like Exodus chapter 22, verses 22 to 24, which says, you shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I surely will hear their cry, and my wrath will burn, and I will kill you with the sword. See, it's verses like that that, we, that our hearts resonate with at times like that because we say, God, is there no justice in the world? How could evil people go on doing such things? Do you not see? See, if you believe that there is a God and you believe what he says actually about himself, you can sleep actually at night knowing that such crimes will not go unpunished at the end of the day and you have a basis actually for calling such things evil, not just saying, well, it might be wrong in your culture. No, that's not wrong in your culture. That's evil. See, all unaided human knowledge and assertions are simply relative without an absolute moral framework. And if you don't have that absolute moral framework, you can't make absolute claims. But if you have God who is truth and who can speak things which are absolute and are forever, then you have a basis for doing this. You know, many of the great non-Christian thinkers of our day understand this, actually, that without a moral lawgiver or without an absolute standard or God, it's very difficult to talk about absolutes. For example, you read Michael Ruse is an atheist and a philosopher of science. This is what he says about morality. Morality, he says, is a biological adaptation, no less than our hands and feet and teeth, considered as a rationally justifiable set of claims about an objective something. Ethics is illusory. I, I appreciate that when somebody says, love thy neighbor as thyself, they think that they are referring above and beyond themselves. Nevertheless, such reference is truly without foundation. Morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction. Any deeper meanings is basically an illusion. You think in this world, if you have no anchor, no absolutes or whatever, and you go around making statements, that's evil, that's right or wrong, what he's saying is that your sense of morality really is just an illusion. You have actually nothing to ground it in. This is what some of our greatest thinkers think today. And, but what does your heart say? I don't care whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian. There are very few in our world, non-philosophers or other, who can't resist that urge and their heart says, no, that does not seem right. I, I'm positive that evil exists. I feel like there's something that's actually good. No, there must be objective rights and wrongs. How do you figure out what is actually right and wrong? Where do you go? Number three, God has revealed wisdom through his word. Verses five and six here, it says, every word of God proves true. He has a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar See, this is the answer to this wearisome search for wisdom. Where do you go to get it? 
Where do you go to get the wisdom to live by? You know, this, this text here is actually a citation from Psalm chapter 18 and also the law of Moses. Agur here is thinking through a biblical framework as he's speaking and writing this scripture here. See, if God is the only, if God only speaks truth, and that is his very nature, then it is true then that God who speaks truth, whatever he says about what is good and what is right and what is wrong and what is evil must stand if he indeed is a truth speaker. If you want to define good, you have actually no choice but to go to something that is absolute. And if God speaks only truth and he is eternal and he is who he says he is, then his word can be a solid foundation for absolute moral truth claims. Now, I know a number of people won't deny this and say, okay, well, of course, if God exists, then of course there must be a standard for good. But my problem is, I'm not sure God exists. Or, wait a minute, why do we need God actually to be good? Why can't we just try to live out good as best that we can, you know, based off of what we most normally think? You know, I don't know how many of you have seen this, but there is um, a number of years ago, Disney published the new live-action Cinderella movie. Very different, actually, from the original Cinderella ver ver uh, movie that was uh, released for kids. Now, in the new uh, Cinderella movie, uh, Cinderella actually has a motto that she lives by. It's the motto of her dead mother, and, her, and the motto is, have courage and be kind. If you look at the movie as a whole, functionally what it says is, if you have courage and be kind, functionally, your fairy tale story will come true, and hopefully you'll marry your prince, and life will live ha happily ever after. Now, the question is, that, that, that little undercurrent message that's there, is that actually true? Is all you need your own subjective sense of what is right and what is wrong? And just a little bit of courage and a little bit of kindness, and all things will eventually work out at the end of the day. Why do we need God anyways? You know, I've heard a number of people that I've discussed who are quite quick to say that, you know what the problem is in this world, Sam? It's actually religions. All these religions of the world that go around telling people what to do. Religions are always fighting. They're always killing people. We would be in a much better state without religion. In fact, this is what many of the new atheists say who are particularly vocal about their hatred, actually, for religion. I think it's really important for us to understand that, sure, religions have been abused. Even abuses have been done in the name of Christ himself. There is no question about that. But one, don't judge our faith by its abuse. Judge it by actually what Jesus is teaching and what God's Word has to say. And the second thing is, if you want to pin religion as being the major problem in this world and responsible for killing all sorts of people, you actually have to look at the flip side. In fact, I would say that it's atheists and atheistic regimes that have murdered far more people in the 20th century. Stalin and Mao Zedong, just those two alone, tens of millions of people, which is far more than all the religions of the world combined. So if you want to say what is actually bad for the world, you might even be able to argue that it's atheistic regimes that in the past had no regard for human life and killed their own people. It's really not fair. See, without an objective moral standard, you actually can't talk about objective good and evil. And in the worst cases, what happens is if you don't have these standards and you begin to lose your sense of what is right and wrong, what is evil may actually be lauded as good in your society. You know, in history, one of the effects of Darwin's theory of evolution was the field of eugenics. Now, some of you might not know what eugenics is, but basically eugenics is a... Uh, bio-social movement that uses science basically to improve the genetics of a human population. That's what it is. Okay, so you're improving the genes of human beings. Now, in the early 1900s, when science basically showed a link between people's genes and bad behaviors like prostitution, drunkenness, and other negative things, eugenicists in Canada and the United States use science basically to create programs to preserve the good gene pool by preventing what they call the unfit in society from breeding. In fact, I don't know if many of you know this, but here in BC, there was actually the Sexual Sterilization Act, which ran from 1933 to 1979, that allowed our province, through the BC Eugenics Board, to sterilize people who are living in government institutions without their knowledge and also without their consent. See, in 1928, this is not even 100 years ago, eugenics 
as cutting-edge science was taught to not only high schoolers, but also to over 376 colleges in the United States and basically over 20,000 students as well. Science basically claimed, and they taught students, that immigration restrictions, segregation of races, and the sterilization of mentally unfit people would be necessary to maintaining American and Canadian culture. So in time, what happened was over some 60,000 Americans were, who had committed crimes, they had poor grades, or they were considered imbeciles, were actually sterilized by their government to prevent their genes from spreading. The Nazis actually credit American eugenicists for their work in giving them the foundation for what later became known as the Holocaust and also the destruction of people they considered to be inferior and unfit for life. They awarded American eugenicists awards for their pioneering work. Now, of course, after World War II's atrocities and the horrors of Auschwitz, Treblinka, and all these death camps came out, eugenics kind of disappeared, you know, rapidly from college curricula because nobody wanted to be associated with that. But the truth of the matter is eugenics in some form still practices, is still practiced today because the human heart has not changed. And I think it happens when we abort babies as well because of their defects. You know, how do such atrocities happen? How do things like this take place? I think the writer Flannery O'Connor nailed it when she talked about why such things can actually happen. Flannery O'Connor said, In the absence of faith, we govern by tenderness, and tenderness leads to the gas chamber. Now, most of us think, did you get that right? Don't you mean that compassion saves people from the gas chamber? Doesn't it keep people out of the gas chamber? And the answer to that is like, absolutely not. Actually, it's the reverse. If you don't have absolute morals that are grounded in God. See, if you think about the great crimes against humanity today, crimes against life, they're all actually cloaked in the language of compassion. Abortion advocates today will advocate and they will say things like, why bring a child into the world who's not going to be loved? Or a child will cause undue mental, financial, and physical hardship on a couple or a mother. And so the physical, mental, and financial well-being of the stronger party, the one with a voice, is taken into consideration and their well-being is preserved over the tiny, weaker life that is sawed into pieces and destroyed and ultimately killed. Why? Because we don't functionally believe that all lives are equal and, are ab and that is an absolute truth. If we truly believe such a thing, you do not choose, choose between absolutes. You must simply work with them and around them. If such things are not absolutes, you will simply weigh the cost and the benefits, and you will always choose one over another. That's exactly what happens. See, when it's a choice in our culture between my life and yours, we don't say both lives are equally valued. We say, if anyone is being taken care of, I'm looking out for me first, and you are second. For the elderly and the disabled, we use similar language. The quality of life is so poor, let them have some dignity in their deaths. Or, the quality of life is so poor, it's probably better that they're dead. And so our compassion actually leads to destruction. In fact, the Nazis had a term for this. In German, it was called Lebensunswert Leben, which means, roughly translated, lives that are unworthy of life. So you, just because you had life didn't mean you were worthy of life. You could be in one of two categories. You could be in the life category that's worthy of life or life that was unworthy of life and therefore could be extinguished. See, if we're just evolved animals, if that's all we actually are, actually isn't it right to eliminate the weak and those who will put a strain on our limited time, energy, financial, and social resources? Isn't that the most responsible? That if you already have three offspring and a fourth one comes in as weak, why jeopardize the whole family? I mean, animals do it. There are a number of birds that will throw the weakest ones out of their nest to give the best others a chance of survival. If we really are thinking about what is best for the species, we should eliminate the weak and keep only the strong. That is the best thing for groups. And in collectivist societies where that kind of thinking is very strong, many of the elderly who are no longer able to contribute and don't want to be a family feel the need to commit suicide to say, this is the greatest act that I can do for my family that is to no longer be a burden. It doesn't matter who you are, a part of us looks at it and just feels revulsion. Something is not right with that. How can human life be purely quantified in terms of pragmatically what benefit it will bring to my family or to society? Is there not something more to the value, intrinsic dignity in a human soul? 
See, without an absolute moral framework, when major suffering happens, you will always make a pragmatic decision to relieve yourself of that suffering, even if it means at the cost of somebody else. And our naturalistic world does this over and over again. Why? Because the naturalistic, materialistic world that we live in cannot see any grand or redemptive or overarching purpose in human suffering. And this is where Christians differ completely. Because a Christian is taught through God's Word to look at suffering and say, this is all under the sovereignty of my God. And I can say, as anyone else can say, Romans 8.28, that all things, all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purposes. So even right now, in my suffering, there must be a purpose in here. God is still good. I remember hearing a Tim Keller sermon in which he talked about an old retired pastor named William, uh, William Willimon, who was ministering to a church lady who had just given birth to a baby. Now, the child had some problems, and the doctor described them to the family. The child had Down syndrome and also a correctable breathing condition, respiratory problem. But the doctor spoke to the parents and recommended that um, what they should do, actually, is just remove the ventilator, allow nature, he said, to take its course. When the couple refused, he actually argued with the couple and said to them, do you know that disabled children can actually cause undue marital stress? And then also, you have two healthy children. Is it fair for you to bring such suffering on your other two children? Why not let just nature take its course? When the doctor mentioned suffering, Willimon says that he looked at the mother's face and he saw her face actually brighten, as if the doctor was finally making sense to her. Suffering, she said to him, we appreciate your concern, but we're Christians. God suffered for us, and we will try to suffer for our baby if we must. Our children have had every advantage in the world. They have really never known suffering. They have never had the opportunity to know it. I don't know if God's hand is in this or not, but I could certainly see why it would make sense for a child like this to be born into a family like ours. Our children will do just fine. When you think about this, this is a really great opportunity. The doctor looked at the parents and was absolutely flabbergasted by a response. And he turned to Pastor Willimon and said, there, Pastor, you try to talk some sense into them. You know, I love that story. You know why? It's because the parents were actually already making sense. And they were making sense because they were operating out of a different moral absolute framework that put God at the very center of all decision-making and rule over their hearts. It's a framework that's built on the perfect wisdom of God. So a parent looking at a disabled child says, little child, I know that you're suffering. I know it's difficult and my life is going to be difficult because of this. But you are made in the image of God, so I will fight for your life because you are absolutely valued intrinsically. It's a mindset that says, I will suffer for you because my master says there is a redemptive purpose in suffering and this will mold me to be more like Jesus. I can do this with joy because my master also suffered and for the joy set before him endured the cross and did not worry at all about the shame. So as I follow my master as well, God help me to have joy so that even as I suffer and this is difficult to me, I'm walking in the footsteps of the one who saved me out of the darkness and calls me as well to follow him. Him. See, if you don't have that worldview, how could you possibly even think that way? It's no wonder that the decisions and the thinking that Christians have look stupid in the eyes of the world. You know, recently I was taking care of a drug addict at night who was going through severe withdrawal. And I remember being there, and while I was wiping the sweat off of his brow and toweling him down, he mumbled to me and just said, Sam, you know, you're, you're such a good guy, you're so kind. Just leave me to die, though. I'm not worth it. And that moment, I remember just feeling such compassion in him. It's like after midnight. And I stroked his hair. And I patted his head. And I said to him, absolutely not. You are made in the image of God. And you are absolutely worth it. I'm not going anywhere tonight, even though you want to get rid of me. And I can say that because my sense of morality and what is right and wrong is grounded in a worldview that says that all lives, all lives are equal in the eyes of the Almighty because they bear His image. As a Christian, killing off the weak is wrong. 
because we are not animals. We are made in God's image. It doesn't matter if you have a disposition in your genes that makes you more prone to certain sins or whatnot or makes you harder to work with. God saved the murderer, Saul of Tarsus, and turned him into a Paul the Apostle. He turned a man like John Newton from a slave driver into a man who wrote Amazing Grace. God dealt with self-centered people like myself and saved me, and he saved you as well. All of you, my brothers and sisters who have come to know Jesus Christ and Lord and Savior, you know what your condition was like before Jesus came to save you. There's no way he saved you because you were great, but you know what you were. And yet in his mercy, he chose to value your life and give you new life. You know, you want to speak about evil, you want to speak about good, you have to invoke God. Because the moment that you speak about evil, you're assuming that there is such a thing as something good. And if you assume there's something called good, you assume that there is an absolute standard or a moral law that makes that thing good and differentiates between good and evil. And if you invoke a moral law, it's certainly not you who's going to make it if it's absolute because you're finite. You must have an absolute moral lawgiver. And who might that be? It has to be God. There is no other option. You know, friends, those of you who are listening to this online or wherever you are, I know some of you are not believers and you tune into this regularly to hear. Let me ask you, does your heart I don't care what philosophers say. Does your heart tell you that right and wrong exist and morality is not some illusion, but it's actually real? If that's true, then God has to exist. And the question is, what is your relationship to Him? Is your life actually a mess right now and you can't seem to fix it no matter what you try to do over and over again? You know, it was just this last week um, that our, our Honda Odyssey, 15 years old now but still running okay, um, is, you know, was having some difficulties. It wouldn't start. I remember going out with my wife, and I grabbed the battery booster pack that I had in my car, I hooked it up, tried to jumpstart the car, and it wouldn't work. You know, I was banging my head trying to figure out, looking at the engine, everything else in the car, is there something I'm missing, whatever? And then I thought, maybe I should read the manual. So I flipped open the manual of the booster, and the booster said, in the case that your battery is really, really dead, use the manual override button, press and hold it for three seconds, and that will allow the thing basically to boost your car. Sure enough, after, I would never have known that, pressed the thing, held it down for three seconds, went to start the car, and the thing roared to life. And I thought about that, about life as I was preparing today, and I thought, yes, that's exactly what it's like for many people. Is that actually you? You know, you're trying to get your car of, on this road of life to do things. You've tried everything. You've cranked the key. You've changed seats. You've turned off the air conditioning. You've tried all sorts of things, and it doesn't seem to work. My question to you is, have you read the manual? Have you read the manual for one who made the car? Because if you haven't, you might want to start there instead. I guarantee you that the guys at Honda and the guys who made my booster pack know way more about these things than I do. So why wouldn't I go to them? And that's just for a car. How much more so for a complex human life that interacts with thousands of people, tens of thousands perhaps, over the course of a lifetime and can impact eternity? You want to go to the manual at that point. You know, friends, God is the source and truth of all knowledge and morality. And because God is, truth exists, and therefore absolutes do exist. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't just say, I'm going to point you to the truth. He said, no, no. I am the truth. I'm not just going to show you that the way is over there. You follow me because I am the way. Life is not just over there. Come into a relationship with me because I am life, and I will give it to whoever I please, whoever will bow their knee to me. See, Jesus lived by the wisdom of God, and though he couldn't see it at the time, his trust in his Father was unwavering, and though he died, and endured the indignity of a crucifixion, looking like a curse from God. In the wisdom of God, he was raised from the dead and now reigns with power at the right hand of the Father. He has broken the curse of the devil, and now all of us who have, were once belonging to that domain of darkness can now be made sons and daughters of the living God, rescued from that evil kingdom and made alive to be children of the living God. That's marvelous if you think about it, what Jesus has done for us. And Jesus, who is the true wisdom of God, calls out to us to follow him. It is amazing to think that God didn't just give us a book to read to learn wisdom. He gave us wisdom incarnate and said, follow that. Follow my son. We are not left in the dark. See, do you want true wisdom for life? 
You want something to anchor your life in. Get rid of your ultimate anxieties and your worry about where you're going when you die, all those sorts of things. You want to know how to live and to deal with these feelings you have in your heart that things are right and wrong, and yet the world doesn't seem to be functioning properly. Go to Jesus Christ. Turn your life over to Him. Turn your life over to the absolute truth that lies behind Him and find an anchor for your soul that goes into eternity. And as you do so, let His morals, His commands, His absolutes guide you. And when you find the joy and ultimate lasting peace that can only be found through Him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for pulling us out of the pit of despair that our culture and its moral relativism have created in people, giving them no solid place to stand on. Thank you for giving us truth, O oh God, so we can do what is right in a culture that's morally confused. And Lord, it's such a blessing, God, to have the darkness of our lives illuminated by the Word of God. And I pray, Father, you help us to live well by the truth so that others, O oh God, might one day find the true light of life. I pray this, Father, in Jesus' almighty name. Amen.